um, I'm Natalia. I'm from Colombia. I'm from the EPOC 2 program. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to uh, share one talk I have on, on your presentation and also ask you a question derived from that. So I do subscribe to the idea of interfirm career. I think that this is like the way to go, but still we have like it like there are some social consequences that could derive from this um, fr from the idea of like for me it would be the state who who should implement this like to my mind comes some kind of horizontal intervention like at public education um, to to solve the problem of the training of the workers and I address this problem because from the po public policy perspective, a neoclassical inspired argument um, often is that why a firm should um, should train a worker if he is leaving and if he is going to the competition, like yeah to the yeah to the yeah to to another firm in in the market. Um, so how could we strategically address this speech, or what kind of policy could we implement to avoid this? Um, um like challenge i would say um um like maybe if you have some ideas of the legal framework that you mentioned that is more favorable in france than in great britain and i yeah and the other question is how should the state pick the sector to implement this um interfirm Interfirm um, career or, or scenario, and the, just the last one is in in the case that the state um, achieves this uh, policy and it starts to work, uh, there is another problem related to productivity because what, like according to your evidence, um, these are not leader firms in their sectors. So how can we um, select the winners, to say, to put it in that terms, um, and not decrease the overall productivity of the economy. If you want to, you want to answer or you want to hear? Yeah, as you, as you want. Um, thank you. Thank you for your, your question and interpretation. Um, so, yeah, l let's a bit more about sorry for the mic. <laughs> uh, a bit more about public policy and what public policy can be done about and, and its interaction with segmentation. Um, well, in a long-term perspective, we actually worked on that with uh, uh, Bernard Gazier in our 2007 article, and um, to put it uh, because it, it nicely answers to the way you put the question. I will quote Bernard Gazier, who worked a lot on transitional labor markets. I don't know if you've heard of that uh, device. It's actually a policy device and the idea that you should equip the market for transitions between work and between situation, okay? Be it working and, and unemployment and inactivity and from one job to another. And his point and others is about the idea that you should equip the market and this has to be understood quite differently from the usual device in public policy that tend to equip the worker. Okay? So this nuance is important because the idea is, again, considering the inequality between employers and employee in their position in the labor market, you cannot consider that equipping the worker is enough. Okay? Because the context is set by the firms and firms' policy. So it is to this level of the context that you must intervene. It's, I mean, this also replicates to any uh, public policy against unemployment, typically, about saying that you should modify the way um, an employment benefit is designed as it, if it would change uh, the, the level of unemployment. It's all putting the burden of unemployment on the workers' side. Okay, you tend to consider you have to change the situation on the workers' side. Whereas labor market segmentation and Bernard Gazin, his work, tend to focus on the idea that, well, the public policy is more difficult, definitely, uh, but the public policy should try to intervene at the firm level or at the market level. Okay? 
So to design the policy devices that are um, uh, resources for workers, but that also ch kind of reshape the labor market, okay, next to the firm's action. So that would be part of the response about how firms should intervene. Because definitely, I mean, you have to try maybe and, and uh, orientate firms' action. But I would not say that I would, tr I would not dare try and decide which firm and which the, how the state should intervene to design career building. I mean, the, the state, I mean, we're, either we're going to a communist economy where the state can d directly define the way career are built, Otherwise, if we stay in some capitalist system, we just would need to find the um, nudges or <laughs> the, ch the, the way to orientate firms' action towards a better uh, quality of career building. Okay, so it wouldn't be about spotting which are the good sectors to implement this kind of firms, of careers, but rather understand how careers are built. Because this we don't know. I mean, there is a lack of work on this that is just huge. Because of the focus on short-term contracts, on unemployment, we know really little about how careers are built in the long term. And then try to understand that. And once you understand it, you can try and activate policy devices. And typically, one important point, if you look at these internal type uh, um, public <coughs> firms, what you see is that their HR department is really important, okay? And some smaller firms or uh, less rich firms won't have the mean to do so. And there you could have a public policy that would help for these HR departments, notably in offering uh, advice for training policy. I mean, you can't ask for firms who don't have a lot of resource to have a very uh, up-to-date uh, training policy. And there you could have public policy that is a resource for firms and not only for workers. Because if you just, uh, uh, um, you know, about the, French, I don't know if you know about the French system of training, of continuous training, but basically it's, you're allowed for some hours of training for each year of um, uh, working. And there tend to be an association of this right to the worker, meaning that uh, it stays built on the worker rather than the market and it still stays very difficult to use this right for a lot of workers and it still stays very used only by those most qualified who know what they want what they need as qualification etc and there's no more general uh, equipment about structuring the market to making it easy for the worker and like natural to go and get trained so it's only accessible for some of these. So typically this is about shaping the market and shaping and as resources for firms and not only for workers that I would advise in terms of intervention. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question together with uh, Francisco that cannot be here right now. Um, so you said and concluded that ILM still exist and are relevant to describe at least part of the labor market in France. And um, yeah, I wanted to know if it implies that dualism, which was at least at first uh, an accompanying notion of uh, ILM, is still uh, relevant to describe accurately the French labor market functioning. And um, especially because of the diversification of uh, forms of employment, as you said, even though they are minor in terms of uh, number of people. So that was the first question. And also, um, to know your, what do you think about the, if, is the secondary market and also the self-employment uh, people really um, in the market that is ruled by uh, labor and demand? Is, uh, we often say that first, uh, the ILM are not ruled by labor and demand and market, but it is the case of the secondary market. But is it really the case? Is it really relevant to say this? Okay, thank you. Um, well, my first, or my answer to your first question, <laughs> my first answer, would be, uh, yes, I still think dualism is a useful heuristic to understand the labor market. Okay, so 
you really have to see it as a heuristic device, meaning it's a key to understanding. It's not saying that there's this big wall like <laughs> separating the labor market in two groups. Okay, I don't think this exists. But the idea that it is useful to have in mind that some workers, you can't just go everywhere in the labor market for some workers, typically about women, about uh, workers with less uh, qualification, and workers for, I don't know, whoever are those in poor conditions in, in terms of individual characteristics, whoever have a low bargaining uh, power, as I said, you can't just get, you can't just um, think the labor market as if they could go everywhere. Okay, and this is where dualism is useful, is to have in mind that they are, uh, some firms are not accessible to those. So if you want, to, you, you have to make something about that. You have to intervene about on, on this uh, point, or maybe have a, a, enlarge the primary uh, segment, or whatever you want to do, but you have to do something about those that are stuck in the secondary labor market, in dead-end jobs, even they, if they are stable. And one point I insist on is, of course, I'm not saying that if you're a self-employed working for 300 euros per month, you're not in a good uh, situation. If you're in a very short-term, repeated short-term contract, you're not in a good situation. But these are not the only bad situations in the labor market. And this is, for me, the interesting point about labor market segmentation, is to point at situations that are better than those, but still not good ones. Okay, which I find is some kind of uh, de uh, dead end. No, not not dead end. Um, like invisible corner in, in, <coughs> in studying the labor market. You tend to focus on those who are in the worst position, those who are in a very good position, and there's this big middle. And I'm just saying, okay, you shouldn't consider this big middle. You should kind of have a look at how this big middle differentiate at least in two groups, it's already a first way of looking at them and differentiating among those who still need public policy and public devices. Okay, uh, one way of understanding that uh, I could, it would be a bit easy in political terms, but I could connect that to the yellow jacket movement. This idea that they're all people who actually work. They're not the worst in, in the worst positions in the labor market, and a lot of study pointed at that. But still, they're frustrated with their situation in the labor market. They keep being afraid of getting into these worse positions. And you can't stand having these just looking away from these and looking only at the worst position. Okay, my argument would be you need, as a public policy, to also have in mind this uh, <coughs> sort of dead-end jobs. They're not terrible jobs, but they're dead-end jobs, and people need a bit more than dead-end jobs to uh, um, as a, to envisage a, nicely envisage a future in the labor market. So this is not to say that every prim primary job are the same. And of course, there is a need to differentiate among the primary. Even if I kind of refer to this dualist version, I do it because I think what is important is looking at secondary jobs. Okay, But of course, in primary sector, I would uh, totally agree that it's necessary to differentiate intra-firm ILMs and inter-firm ILMs and uh, uh, study that more and know more about that. But in the end, the final policy uh, um, objective of knowing better that is intervening for the others. Um, just another word, it's usual to define the Doringer and Puri's work uh, on second, on because they focus on primary labor market, it's usual to say that they consider that the secondary labor market is some kind of competitive market, but it's actually not the case. When you look at their work, and I would follow them completely on that, sorry for the micro, um, the secondary labor market would be defined as firms who do not put in place internal labor markets, okay? which doesn't say they're, not go they're going to be a neoclassical black box <laughs> from one day to the other. It's just that when they have to decide the wage level, okay, they would just look at what they have as a view of the market, meaning next door firm, um, um, advertisement for jobs, and they would tend to pay the same job as their representation of the market wage. Okay? And 
the, the idea that they would, uh, again, I'm going to quote Bernard Gazier, who would call about uh, the, the, the captation de main d'oeuvre. So lab labor force captation, like you just, okay, you grab the, 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 the qualification and you use them, but you don't try to keep it, you don't try to develop it, you don't try anything special, you just buy it, okay? Which is somehow different than uh, a Valrassian representation of the labor market. Okay, any other question? I have one, okay, maybe if, if there is one, then I, I have one. Do, do we have a similar question, a similar study than, than that for Japan or Germany, which are country that, I mean, we can suppose that they, they look, lo look like more France uh, in the labor market. Is there any comparison? Is, are they more developing ILMs or not? Uh, actually, I don't know if any. They, they are, um, maybe surprisingly, the closest I would guess would be Japan rather than Germany because the, the German system and the German interpretation of labor markets, the German way of labor market segmentation is really based on continuous on initial training and occupational labor market and this seems to still be uh, important. And what I would say for Germany, and some colleagues did work on that, would be the idea that you also would have some kind of shrinking of this traditional version of uh, occupational labor market, but that it still exists. On the contrary, from the Britain case, where David Marsden has rather argued that it's just disappeared, um, because it was also based on, on um, union, and that union had a bad time in the 1980s <laughs> with Thatcher. And so this kind of undermined all occupational labor market in the British case, whereas in the German case, uh, because it was based on all this initial training system, continuous training, initial, uh, initial continuous training uh, system, it still kind of happens, but also in some sort of a shrinked version. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know of, of any work in this line for Japan, but you also have, uh, well, you have some work, th there is a traditional version of Japan, of Japan employment, very stable in a lot of internal career that still exists, but also shrinked. So y basically I would guess you would have the same line of, of discussion. In the same line as David, I wanted to ask if you know some works uh, that use the same framework that you use, but for developing countries, uh, for example, like in Latin America. And then I wanted to ask something very simple, but the databases that you used, uh, these ones, I don't remember, mm -hmm. Repon, yeah, and, and the other one, uh, they're of public domain. I mean, they are conducted by the public, I, I think, and they include like private, uh, firms, but also public, and mm -hmm. like if you can access to the data, like any researcher can access mm -hmm. to that data. Okay, I don't, uh, um, <coughs> there is a whole literature on segmentation in developing countries, but it tends to focus on um, black market as a secondary segment. Okay, so it's kind of an independent literature from those on uh, developed countries. Uh, what you would, uh, another connection, interesting connection would be on the work of Thibaut de Guillem. I don't know if you had a, uh, yeah. an intervention from him, yeah? He actually did his PhD on uh, labor market segmentation in the Colombian labor market, if I remember well. Um, so yeah, definitely he would be a good entry to that question in a way to put it uh, close to the French way. Um, yeah, the database. A, a, a difference, uh, and for a lot of uh, work on labor market segmentation, just to add, uh, typically those on uh, developing countries, it's a lot about workers, data sets and information about workers, which is great for a point, but kind of derives attention to workers rather than firms. And as you understand, I kind of find it's very important to enter into the question with firms. And this is uh, one point where it's difficult to compare analysis from the two type of uh, 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 analysis. Uh, about data sets, the first answer is that you don't have public sector in, in France. 
you have it actually in the UK for the British version, but because we wanted like the minimum common set of firms, we had to get rid of the uh, uh, public sector for um, for both data sets. Uh, second answer or second question was about access to these data sets. They are easy and you can have a very easy access to a version of Réponse which basically does not have wages. Uh, you have, you, I mean, any researcher and you as a student can have access even to the complete version. But the f access to the full version, will, you would have to pay for it because you would have to need to get access through um, anonymized box and you need, um, this has a cost. But on the principle, you, everyone has access in a research. Um, anyone in the research in the academy can have access and US students can. And there's a version of it without wages uh, that you can have access very easily as a student if you want to work on it. And as I guess, uh, as I remember, it's also very easy to have access to the words version. So computing the two in the way we advise in the website can be accessible for any academic. Okay, last question. So, ah, uh, yes. Thank you for the presentation, first of all. Can you hear me? Uh, just <laughs> say it loud, yeah. I'll take off my mask for, the, for a moment. I'm not sure the mic works, um, but it's okay. I remember on your last slide you brought up a point about having a labor market inter-firm, so between firms. And actually in Austria, like I'm from Austria, like the new industrial policy, they try to do some things that are called like flex security. So they want to make people move in between firms, keeping some certain kind of securities and stuff they had accumulated in their old jobs with them, so it's easier to change. Uh, and now we have this discussion coming up where one part is arguing that this is increasing the flexibility of the worker and will give them more bargaining power. And the other uh, side is kind of worrying that this might push a little more responsibility towards the state and actually decrease labor conditions like overall. And I was just wondering if you maybe have a uh, take on this or like an assessment of how this could play out. Thank you. Thank you. I actually don't know about this specific device, uh, obviously, uh, uh, in Austria. What is interesting is, uh, to me is that, remember I talked to you about transitional labor market, uh, the work by Bernard Gazier and others, and uh, Gunther Schmidt, notably, in Germany. And he actually, I remember, he had this focus on Austria, wh wh who, which country had a, a very specific um, device already, was in terms of replacement from unemployment to work. And they had all this system of when someone was uh, on a long-term leave, there would be a whole system to get an, a long-term unemployed into the job, in long-term kind of reinsertion into the job and all this organization of these transitions, which were uh, typically w what he would quote as equipping the market. So he would use to quote the Austrian case as one where uh, the <coughs> there would be a focus uh, more on equipping the market than the worker. This would give me a good um, a priori on your case, but I have no more uh, information about this specific case. And obviously, uh, you could see with the French version of uh, continuous training, it's not only, you cannot just give a right to workers. This is not enough for those with poor bargaining power to use this right. This we know from the French case, definitely, so. Okay, that was the final question. Thank you very much, Eloise. Thank you.